Lewis Chapel. Praise the Lord, everybody. Is anybody excited to be in the house of worship one more time? Hallelujah. Our God is great and he's greatly to be praised. We invite you to stand to your feet all over the room. Join in in lifting up this anthem. How great is our God. Hallelujah. Clap your hands all over the room like this. Listen, the song says, How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. Oh, see how great, how great. Lift it up all over the room, man. Everybody sing how great, how great. Bless your name in this place where you've done great things in our lives. 
God, you are awesome. You are amazing. We worship and bless you tonight. God, we offer you the fruit of our lips tonight. Somebody just say something sweet to him today. God, we love you. We honor you in this moment, God. We give your name all the praise. You are truly worthy of all our praise. I will bless the Lord, oh my soul, hallelujah, and all that is within me, bless his holy Come on, let's lift it up. Bless his holy name. Come on, let's take it back. I will bless the Lord. Let's sing it together. I will bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. And all that is within me. And all that is within me. Bless it all. We come to bless his holy name.
Yeah, I'm good. God's grace and peace be with you. Hey, how y'all doing, Lewis Chapel? Is it a is it a sign of age when in order to get up from bending over, you gotta make some noise? To, like, ugh. Mm. You know what I mean? You bend over, but you gotta, you gotta give yourself some verbal strength to get up. No? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And like you can get back up again. It's just you gotta you gotta verbalize the process. So I digress. <laughs> hey, it is always so good to to be in in worship and in fellowship with each and every last one of you. Let me uh, now. I know some of y'all are like, what is he doing here? So there was a there was a scheduling mix up. So I'll be out of town for revival at a later date. I will share that with you when I know, but, I, because, but kudos to you, because you know some people when the pastor's away, y'all know what I'm talking about, when, when the pastor's away, they like, well, I mean, he gone, I'ma be gone, excuse me, not I'ma be, but y'all know what I mean. Okay, listen. I need, so homecoming is coming up. There's a multitude of things that we will be doing to celebrate homecoming. Uh, is there a homecoming appeal tonight? Because I don't want to be redundant. If there is, if there's not, I'll go ahead and continue with what I was going to say. Okay. Uh, one of the things I want you to be mindful of with homecoming is that part of how we celebrate in the community is also being a blessing to the community in several ways. One of these things that we're going to be doing this year is we are uh, taking donations of hygiene products that we're going to be donating to two different schools. I'll be telling you what those schools are this coming Sunday. One of them we are hoping to uh, solidify and finalize is a, uh, is a school that's not in this country that we're going to send some hygiene products to. Now, I could enumerate what hygiene products are, but I'm going to trust that you know what hygiene products are. Is that? Are we good? So, uh, so to those of you in this space, to those of you who are watching our Connected Campus, if you will, uh, between now and our last donation day will be homecoming Sunday into Sunday. So just bring those hygiene products in. There'll be spaces in both lobby areas, bins in both lobby areas, that you can donate that. Down at the church office, you can uh, drop those things off all throughout the week. And uh, we thank you for being a blessing to these two schools that we are going to, uh, to contribute these items to. Now, on Wednesday, next Wednesday, next Wednesday, somebody say Wednesday. Wednesday. All right. Some of y'all said next Wednesday, but I just say Wednesday. So, next Wednesday, next Wednesday, we are going to be at our John D. Fuller Rack on Old Bunce Road. We're having a pep rally. E.E. E. Smith is coming. Douglas Burr is coming. Uh, Jack Britt is coming, Westover is coming, and we will be in the building and we're gonna have a good time uh, celebrating our 113th homecoming in grand spectacular fashion. There'll be concessions that you can buy, there'll be games and prizes, I mean, it is gonna be a good time. So tell somebody that knows somebody, we gonna pack that gym out and have a good time. Those kids' parents will be there, and their family will be there. So this is what our homecoming is about. Our homecoming is about us celebrating 113 years with the community that God has blessed us to be a part of. And on Friday, on Friday at, I believe, beginning at 6 o'clock, we're going to have uh, two basketball games. The first basketball game will be between our teenagers. So if your teenagers want to sign up for that, please make sure that they do so by Sunday so we'll, we can have an accurate account for, or at least a somewhat accurate account of how many kids will be in it. Our adults will play next. So, uh, and once again, the females you want to play, uh, we might have some Caitlin Clarks out there or some... Uh, some Angel Reese's, y'all like, not, not Kaylee. We might have some Angel Reese's out there or some, those, those really the only two names I know people are playing right now, but we might have some of those out there. So uh, to men and to women, you are welcome to play. 
on that Friday. Once again, there'll be something co that comes out, Malik, probably tomorrow, if it's not out already on social media, with links you can click to register and just let us know that you're going to be a part of the game. Then on Saturday, we're going to be golfing. Look, that, that, that golf tournament, it is, it is filling up. I look forward to the competition. Brother Dalvin, he, he's on my team. So he and I and Brian and Brother, uh, brother Rudy, we got our team. We, we have our squad. And from what I also hear, the ladies are getting their teams together as well. So we're going to go out 1 o'clock. It's our tee off time. It'll be multiple uh, contests, like the long driving contest, closest to the pin contest. And uh, I do plan. I plan on winning, just, just so you know, just, just so you know, I, I, I plan on winning. So, uh, but we're going to have a good time. Somebody stopped by today just to, uh, just to sign up for it because he saw the advertising and wanted some help registering. So I, so I love the way that's coming together. And of course, the last one I need to let you know, Sunday, we're going to have powerful worship. Then after our 11 o'clock worship, we're going back to the rack. We're going to have uh, several food trucks. We're going to have multiple dessert trucks. And you can get a free dessert, free meal at a food truck. All you got to do is just come worship with us either here in Fayetteville or here uh, are there at Lewis Chapman Rayford. We'll make sure that you get a ticket and you can go to any food truck of your choice and get a free meal, any dessert truck of your choice, get a free dessert. The only thing we ask you to do is come worship with us. If you come worship with us, we the meal is on us. If you don't come worship with us, we'll still see you out there, but the meal is on you. There's going to be games, there's going to be bingo, there's going to be kickball, there's going to be dodgeball, there's going to be jumpies, there's going to be carnival rides. It is going to be amazing. So y'all help me get the word out in the community because once again, our 113 years of celebrating is not just about us at Lewis Chapel. It is about celebrating with the community that God has placed us in. And now having said all of that, and that was a lot. But now, having said all of that, let's bless the Lord through our giving. Let's bless the Lord through our giving. My brothers and sisters, we know that God has blessed us. We know it. We know God has blessed us. Not a doubt in our mind. Not a doubt in our soul that the Lord has smiled on us. And when we get opportunity to worship the Lord and to serve him, we know that it is pleasing in the sight of God. That's why y'all are here tonight. That's why y'all are connected with us wherever you are, because you understand that we are here to serve the Lord and to give him glory. And part of serving him and giving him glory is our giving. We are a church that believes in the blessing of giving. We are also a church that believes in the challenge in charge of tithing. So we give God the tenth, which is tithing, and we also love God so much that we give an offering even after we tithe. So my brother and sister, if you will be so moved by the love of God in your heart that you give on today, then we pause so that you may celebrate God through your giving. Four ways you can give. You can give in the envelope. You can write a check. I was talking to somebody just the other day, and they told me they have two checkbooks. I was like, well, you go ahead with your bad self. <laughs> you can write a check. You can uh, go to lewischapel.org. Top of the page, this place says give. And two apps you can download. One called Church Center. One called Givelify. All these ways have been made avail available so that none of, us none of us have to miss the blessing of giving. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for your light that shines in our life, that keeps us out of the darkness and in your marvelous light. God, we thank you for this chance to give and ask that it is blessed in your sight. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And the church said, amen. Thank you. 
tried and true. And we're thinking I'll be living sanctuary. Cheney's in the building. Hey, how are you doing out there, Lewis Chapel? This is Creel Cheney. I'm on your digital media team as the lighting illumination senior engineer. Maybe I made that up, I don't know. This is my lovely wife, Tamika Cheney. Hi Say hi, guys. Baby. hello. <laughs> and where we at right now, take a look. 113 years, baby. Homecoming, be out here next week. We got Ferris wheel over here food trucks over here, electric slide. Do church people do the electric slide? Yes, of course. Okay, and oh, we can't forget, we got our baby Coco Cheney right here doing her thing. <laughs> She's part of the homecoming committee, the doggy homecoming committee, that is. <laughs> Maybe I made that up, who knows? Yes. Well, I'm gonna tell you like this, a very special person told me, it is up to you to make sure you don't feel like a stranger in your own church. So come out yes. and get involved. Thank you. Thanks. Coco. Get the frisbee, Coco. Get the frisbee. Get the frisbee, Coco. No. I told y'all, it's home. We're homecoming. Listen, without further ado, I want to introduce our teacher for tonight. She's our, she's our own Reverend Odom. She is uh, gifted and anointed and so faithful and in my blessing to work in ministry with. So receive her by saying amen. amen. Good evening, Lewis Chapel Fayetteville and Lewis Chapel Connected Campus. It's so good to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Prayers are already gone forth, so I'd just like to let those who might not know that I am Reverend Odom, and we'll look for tonight's Lean In Bible Study. We will look to the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. King James Version. Again, that's the gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. King James Version. It reads in this manner. Now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And Martha was coming about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, 
Doest thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken from her. Again, I want you to focus your eyes on number, verse number 39. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. I'm pulling out our leaning Bible topic tonight from that verse. Shut your mouth. Sit at his feet. Help me say it, Lewis Chapel. Shut your mouth. Sit at his feet. Amen. What does the phrase, shut your mouth, mean? Stop talking. Quiet. It means to be quiet immediately, not, 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 not next week, but immediately to cease talking. The phrase, shut up, can be rude. It can be aggressive. It can be offensive, depending on the context in which the word is used or the punctuation marks behind it. When you yell forcefully, shut your mouth, leave me alone. That can be rude and offensive. However, if you say that same phrase, shh, shut your mouth, I can't hear. It takes on a different connotation and it's not, it's not rude and it doesn't sound like someone has uh, used profanity in your ears. Well, tonight I come to discuss times when Christians, that's you and me, should keep our mouth shut. Lewis Chapel, we've already said a few, but what are some other phrases that suggest the word shut up? In our Lewis Chapel Connected Campus, you can write your words on the website. What are some other ways you can say shut your mouth? Hush, be quiet. What about pump your brakes? I hate that one. My son used that one. Pump your brakes. Pump your brakes, mom. Pump your brakes. Don't make a sound. Any others? Hold on. Shut up. Don't talk. All of those words I suggested are the phrase. Another way to say, shut your mouth. The Bible has plenty to say about the mouth. Do you know any scriptures or any, thing, any scriptures anywhere that you remember where the Bible talks about the mouth? There's life and death in the tongue. And we are urged tonight to not speak death, but life. What about the tongue? Can it be tamed? James said it's an unruly member. It said you can, uh, James goes on to say that it's like a fire that starts out real small. And it grows and grows and grows, destroying everything in its root. Trees, houses, animals, everything is destructive. James says that our tongue is like that. He also said that we can train a dolphin or a, a whale to jump through a hoop with fire, but we can't tame that little member in our mouth, our tongue. Said it's untamable. However, I suggest to you that if you want to tame it, there is a way we have to submit to the Holy Spirit and we have to ask God to help us tame it. He's not going to do it on his own. We have to ask for God's help. And also the Bible says that there's blessings and curses spoken with the mouth and it encourages us not to praise God. Hallelujah. God, you're wonderful. God, you're so good. God, you're mighty with your mouth and turn around and curse someone out with it. That's not what we do. Blessings and curses should not flow from the same mouth. And Proverbs 13 and 3 says, Whosoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens his mouth, his lips, comes to ruin. And then I'm reminded that the Bible says, that the word, Let the words of my mouth, the words of my mouth, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. The mouth is very important and it's also, it can be destructive or 
constructive. What are some ways in which we can use our mouth constructively and destructively? What are some ways? Prayer, constructive. Encouragement, constructively. Any other ways? What about to complain, to nag, to argue, to scold, to gossip, and to speak life? We can use our tongues in this way. The Bible says our mouth is full of deadly poison. Only God can tame it. We have to submit it unto him. To go back to St. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, it's a time of evangelism for Jesus Christ and the disciples. As they had done on many occasions, they become tired and they are hungry, so they stop at Martha's home for a meal and a little relaxation, R&R. Martha and Mary were the sisters of who? And what did Jesus do for Lazarus? How long did he wait to raise him from the dead when the sister said, come Jesus, Lazarus is sick. Jesus intentionally waited how many days before he went to see about Lazarus? That was because after then they said, according to the Jewish custom, the spirit had already left the body. So he wanted to let Mary and Martha know that he was the life, the truth, and the resurrection. So he waited four days. Nevertheless, he was raised from the dead. And then hospitality was very important in biblical days. Strangers were received into homes, and when the family went about doing their daily, daily, daily chores the next day, they left strangers in their home. I can hear us saying now, I'm not leaving anybody in my home to be plunging around while I'm gone. But hospitality, hospitality was great then. It provided food and shelter and protections for strangers. They didn't have to know them. But they were obligated to do so. It was in the Mosaic law. It was required. It was a sacred duty. It was just what they did since hotels, well, inns were so far in between. So families took care of families back then. And I want to encourage you today as you think on this, be careful how you treat strangers. Because the Bible says you may entertain angels unaware. So Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. She was listening at every word that came out of his mouth. However, Martha was perceived, was preoccupied and distracted by putting up curtains, dusting the furniture, um, setting the food, getting the food, putting up decorations, everything. She was concerned about the home. And she got a little tired and she went to Jesus and said, Jesus, don't you care that my sister won't help me? I'm tired. Lord, make her help me. Have you ever been doing a church work and seemed like nobody would help you? You said, Lord, I'm tired. Send somebody to help me. This is where Mary was. And Mary said, said to, she was no doubt only saying to Jesus, this is a team effort. And Mary has left the team. Tell her to help me. Can you imagine the audacity of Martha interrupting the Lord Jesus Christ as he was expanding on the word with such trivia? Can you imagine that? Actually, we do the same things. Sometimes on Sunday, our pastor or our speaker is focused on the word, and we bring trouble to them or something, one, some agenda that, that we think he needs to take care of. Be careful. We can see ourselves in the scriptures, but we are to learn by it. And Jesus uh, just told Martha, you're troubled and you're upset by many things. Mary had anxiety. She had anger issues at this point. But Jesus continues to say, Martha, all of this drama, all of this fanfare is unnecessary. Your sister Mary has chosen to sit at my feet. As a matter of fact, she has chosen the best thing, the word of God, to listen to it and, and let it saturate her being and make her better. Here's the point. Martha spent her time preparing natural food for Jesus while Mary was being spiritually fed by Jesus. Both of them are good, but they have to be in perspective. If you notice, during this time, Mary never, never, never said a word. She kept her mouth shut. Mary kept sitting at the feet of Jesus. 
And I submit to you tonight, there are times when we must keep our mouth shut also and just sit at the feet of Jesus. And Mary sat not in a, a reclining chair like the other disciples did. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. This was the posture of humility and the posture of a student. The way that the men said to those around them that they were learning from a rabbi, a great teacher. The men, nevertheless, they were shocked at Mary, but they didn't say anything. Why? Because women had no rights at this time. Women were second-class citizens. Mary went outside of the norm. As a matter of fact, she broke the law. She broke the traditions of that time. Mary broke the law, but Jesus received her. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus in a male-dominated world and became a disciple of Jesus. Mary shattered the glass ceiling, and the women, the lives of women and girls, changed instantly for the better. What does it mean to sit at the feet of Jesus? What do you think it means to sit at the feet of Jesus? Connect to campus, you can write in your responses. What does it mean to sit at the feet of Jesus? To acknowledge him. Yes. What does it mean to sit at the feet of Jesus? To humble yourself. What does it mean? Good responses. To sit at the feet of Jesus. To give reverence. To receive blessings. We can sit at the feet of Jesus also to be quiet, to shut our mouths and listen to him. Sitting at the feet of Jesus means studying, memorizing, and, and, and rehearsing the word of God in your heart. Sitting at the feet of Jesus means to show an intimate relationship that you might have with the Father. We sit at the feet of Jesus, and in us, many times is birthed a powerful prayer life. We sit at his feet to express gratitude. We sit at his feet to become more like him, because the more we commune with him, the more we talk with him, the more we become like him. Sitting at the feet of Jesus helps us when we're anxious. Sitting at the feet of Jesus will help us when we're frustrated. Sitting at the feet of Jesus will help us when we're worried. Sitting at the feet of Jesus will help us when we're overwhelmed. Psalm 61 says, when my heart is overwhelmed, don't take me to the mall. Don't take me to the park. Lead me where? Lead me where? To the rock. That's higher than I. And sitting at the feet of Jesus is an act of worship. Sometimes we have to sit at his feet quietly with no words and just worship him. We're talking about Mary and Martha. Who was Mary? Who was Mary in this lesson? Who was Mary? Martha's sister, and whose sister? Lazarus and Martha's sister. Was she concerned about anything, cooking? What was she concerned about? Sitting at his feet. She wanted to sit at his feet. And what about Martha? Who was Martha? What did Martha do in the scriptures? She was worried about, as a matter of fact, her name means lady of the house. In biblical days, your name defined who you were, and she was definitely concerned about the house, keeping it, getting it neat, the appearance. She was, she was worried about the food, the tablecloths, the curtains, the rugs, the sweeping, the dusting, everything. She was worried about that, but she was true to her name. She was large and in charge. She prepared everything, and she did it very, very meticulously. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the word tells us to everything there is a season, 
and a time for every purpose under the heaven. It goes on to say that there's a time to be born. There's a time to die. There's a time to plant. And there's a time to pluck up. It goes on to say that there's a time to weep and a time to laugh. Then it goes on to say there's a time to keep silent. And then there's a time to speak. We can't always speak. We don't have to respond to everything. Remember, we do not have to respond to everything. And we do not have to respond to everybody. Many times before we speak, we need to take time to process what's been said. Because depending on our state of mind, you might mean one thing, and I might view it as another thing. Then we have the water's trouble. Take time to process sometimes before we speak. Sometimes the best response is no response at all. And remember what people say about you does not define you. Only what God thinks about you matters. When someone speaks to you rudely or as a matter of factly or any kind of way, you don't have to say anything. It doesn't make you weak. It makes you wise. The law does not require you to speak. It's not written in stone. Can you think of many times that you were at home and an argument just came out of nowhere? It came like, like in Jerusalem, they says, uh, you, you carry an umbrella or a rain gear all the time because of the way it's situated and, and the way it works together with the, the way the water and the atmosphere work together. It might rain any time. It might be a sunny day and all of a sudden it rains. So that's how, what happens sometimes. We're at home and an argument arise out of nowhere. If you don't say anything, do you think somebody's going to keep speaking to you and you're not answering? Just saying, just saying, uh, if they're saying, you know, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have said that. Why did you do that? And just keep on dusting. Keep on doing what you're doing. Keep on cooking. Pretty soon they're going to go and sit down. We don't have to respond to everything. Hmm. Just keep sitting at the feet of Jesus. Many times we need to do that until things get better. There are many occasions that we should shut our mouths and sit at his feet. We've already defined what sitting at his feet means. Here are a few times. Number one, you should shut your mouth when you're angry. Why should you shut your mouth when you're angry? What did you say? There you go. We can say you can, uh, you can hurt my feelings. I forgive you. But the damage has already been done. When I go home, I'll think about that thing. Before I go to bed, I'll think about that thing. Even though I have forgiven you, you hurt me. It says, Proverbs said, a man of quick temper acts foolishly. Short temper people do foolish things all of the time. Hot headed, angry people do things they regret later all of the time. Stop, think, regroup, breathe in, breathe out. Shut your mouth. Take a moment to sit at the feet of Jesus. Keep sitting there. Keep sitting there until things change. Ephesians 4 says, be angry and sin, and sin not. And don't let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. What does that mean? It means I can't sin, I can't be angry. I can't be, does it mean I can't be angry? Make peace? Why do you think you should make peace before you go to sleep? Because you may not wake back up. Tomorrow isn't promised. 
So we're doing ourselves really an honor to not hold on to anger, to not let it disrupt our lives. We may not wake up in whatever state, the word I'm reminded of Revelation said, whatever state God finds us in, when he comes, that's the state that he's going to judge us in. We can't go back and say, God, I'm sorry. We can't go back and redo anything. So we have to do things correct the first time. Have you ever had someone do a job incorrectly and you had to go back and do it correctly? Did it not take more time to redo it than it did if it would have been done correctly the first time? Be angry is not a sin, but anger can become a sin if we act upon it. That's why we're supposed to get rid of it quickly. Love your brothers, love your sisters. We're all going to error. We're all going to make mistakes. No one is exempt from mistakes. But we ought to love them and forgive them when they ask. Because if we don't forgive others, what does the word say? If we don't forgive others, what does the word say about forgiveness? God won't forgive us. Can you imagine having a hard heart against someone and for 10 years, I won't forgive them for what they said. It's been 10 years, baby. Wake up. <laughs> Smell the coffee. It's been 10 years, baby. Get over it. If you won't forgive them, then you can do something. Then you say, God, forgive me. He's got his back turned to you. He's not listening. Simply because you have unforgiveness, unforgiveness in your heart. We have to forgive and let live. And you should shut your mouth when you're yelling and screaming and losing control of yourself. Why should you shut your mouth at that time? But they did this, but they did that. They treated me wrong. Why should, what should we do? Why shouldn't we yell and scream and and, 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 and get all upset with someone? Why shouldn't we do that? Why wouldn't we do that? Why should we do that? I can't hear you. It's bad for your health. If you're not careful, you can go into cardiac arrest. No kidding. No kidding. It's all about your health, and it's all about living the word of God and doing the right thing. Be calm. Talk slowly, talk softly, choose your words carefully. Proverbs says that he who has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that has broken down walls. In biblical days, the city needed walls for protection and security. They didn't, if the walls were torn down, anybody, any army, any who could just come in and destroy them unaware. And sometimes broken words are cruel like that. And they creep up on an individual. And they change the tra tra trajectory of their life forever. What we continually say to people can harm them. Mothers sometimes say, you're like your no good father. Or you're like your selfish mama. If the brain processes that long enough, guess what? It's going to hurt. They, see, they can see their daddy struggling with issues, substance issues and all of that. Just because daddy is one way does not mean that the sons or the daughters have to be that way because we serve a God who's able to break all chains. He's able to deliver. What did they see, say? The, the demons, the demons that are in the family. He's able to, to break chains and to destroy them. There's nothing too hard for God. Number three, you should shut your mouth when you will say, when what words you say will ruin their life, their reputation. In other words, let me say that again. 
You should shut your mouth when what you say will ruin a person's reputation. What is a reputation? How other people see you. As a matter of fact, it comes from a Latin word, meaning consideration. How other people's, people see you, not how you see yourself. If they see you in a good context, that's your reputation. If they see you as loving and kind and all of that, that's good. That's your reputation. How it, your reputation is what other people see, consider you to be. And if we're going to, to say something, many times we say things that we don't know anything about. We heard it through the grapevine. What's the grapevine? When did the grapevine start talking? Hearsay. And we can't do that. We cannot do that. We have to know what we say. And many times those things that we know, we shouldn't say because we are going to hurt our brothers and our sisters. And I'm reminded that the Bible says, do good to everyone, especially those that are in the household of faith. And to break that down, do good to everybody, especially those that are your sisters and your brothers in the church. Especially do good to them. Don't do, don't spread rumors. If you don't know about it, you know something, if you, if you don't know something and you spread it and it's not true, what have you done? Spread a lie. What does the Bible say about lying? The Bible says, a liar shall not tarry in my sight. And then again, he said that a liar would have his part in the lake of fire. So if we say things we don't know, it's not that we mean to lie. That's why it behooves us sometimes to shut our mouths. Be quiet. Just sit at his feet. Every question or everything does not deserve it, does not require an answer. That's not law. It's not a law. It's not written in stone. Sometimes we have to just be quiet and sit at his feet. We can pray about it. We can worship about it. We can just talk to God about it. That's what sitting at his feet means. And if we find ourselves doing more of that, It'll make us better, not bitter, but better. Again, once the words go out, they're out there. It's like uh, writing a text. Before you send a text, if you're upset, think about that thing. Write it. Write that text. Let it marinate, as they say. Let it marinate overnight or let it marinate for a few hours and you're fine. It's not even important anymore. But if you'd have said that, you would have been okay. But the person you sent it to, what, what would happen to them? They would have been very upset. I dare she send that text to me. Sit at his feet. Pray about a thing. Sit at his feet. Read the word. Sit at his feet. Till things get better. So we're looking at the reputation of a person, his character. Don't destroy anybody's character. Don't do it. Don't you do it. Even if what's circulating is true, don't do that. Those are some of them, we are your brothers and your sisters. Don't do that. Don't destroy family. Our homecoming thing, we're family. We're definitely family. And family needs to treat family as such. And be it sure, Galatians says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. Do you know what that phrase means? It's a proverb. Do you know what it means? It simply means you reap what you sow. It's a proverb, again, that says future consequences are radically shaped by present action. Future consequences are radically shaped by, pres by present actions. So we need to act with wisdom. We need to act wise. We need to do those things that are pleasing in the sight of the Lord. Then again, you should shut your mouth when your words 
are a poor reflection of the God you serve? In what ways can your words or your actions be a poor reflection of the God you serve? What are some, some ways that what we say and how we act can be a poor reflection of the God we serve? Not in love? Absolutely. And then again, something someone else, she said, not in love. How can our actions, our actions can offend God if we say that we're living for him. We say that we're full of the spirit. We say that we know him in the pardons of our sins. And, and, and we don't live like we have changed. That's offensive to our God. That's offensive to his character. That's offensive to who he is. It's like a chameleon. Sometimes, whatever color, a chameleon is a lizard-like animal. If he's on a green, a green grass, he's green. If he's on a red covering or whatever, he turns red. If he's on brown grass, he turns brown. That means that we're not who we say we are. We're subject to move. As people of God, we've got to be true to our nature. We've got to be true to our God. We've got to be who we say that we are. Because Christ suffered for us. And he left us an example. He didn't bend. He didn't fold. He wasn't weak. He left us an example. And there was no gal found in his mouth. Jesus, Jesus was reviled, but he reviled not. What does the word revile mean? Do you know what that meant? Despised. Talked about badly. Our attitude check should be Philippians 2 and 5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. That's our attitude check. Then we ought to let our light so shine before men that they may glorify, that they may see our, let your light so shine before men that men may see your good works and glorify who? You? Your Father in heaven, we have a life to live and a God to glorify. And number five, you should shut your mouth when it's time to listen. Proverbs again says, a wise son, a wise person, hears, hear what his father says, listen to his father. But a disrespectful person does not. And not knowing when to stop talking will get you in trouble. Have you ever experienced that? Learning when to be silent is a valuable, valuable skill. This will help you when you begin to talk. Others will listen to you. One kindness deserves another kindness. And when two people are talking, is there real conversation going on? No. Why? No real conversation. Why is no real conversation going on? Nobody is listening. No one knows what the other person is saying. Silence is golden. That's a true phrase. Yes, there are times when you should be silent, and there are times when you should speak up. It has been said many times that we have two eyes, two ears, and one mouth. We need to use them correctly. Talk less, watch and listen more. Lewis Chapel Fayetteville and Lewis Chapel Connected Campus. Many Christians have exposed themselves to battles that they had no business with. If they would have kept their mouths shut and kept sitting at the feet of Jesus, kept worshiping him, kept praising him, kept, kept you know, just being in his presence, Concentrating on his word, things would have turned out a whole lot differently. To sit at the feet of Jesus is a perfect place to be so that we can order our steps in the word, so that we can order our, step, our steps in God's way. And it gives us believers, if we stay in the word, it gives us word that we can defeat the devil with. 
or when the enemy comes to us and tells us we're not this or we're not that or God is not going to give us a miracle or God is not going to heal our body, we can receive a plethora of knowledge of the word to fight the enemy with. We can boldly declare the word sometimes when we're going through. We can say, I am the head and not the tail. I am above only and not beneath. I am a lender and nobody has to borrow. And I don't have to, you know, I'm the lender, not the borrower. In other words, I have what the other people need simply because God has provided. And I'm more than a conqueror through him that loves us. Keep sitting at the feet of Jesus. No matter what happens, no matter what comes your way, don't get distraught, don't get upset. Keep living a life, a life that's acceptable unto our Lord Jesus Christ. And be the example that the world needs. The world is angry. It's a mess out there. The world is angry. They're fighting. It's a dog-eat-dog world. Everybody wants to be the Indian. Nobody wants to be the chief. But we are a team effort. Somebody has to lead and somebody has to follow. Keep sitting at his feet until things get better, Lewis Chapel. Keep sitting at his feet until things get, wet, get better, Lewis Chapel Connected Campus. You are a winner. You are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. God bless you. Let the church say amen. amen. And thank you for teaching us tonight and reminding us the importance of knowing when not to talk. Hey, uh, do me a favor, Creel. Could you take the lights up a little bit in the sanctuary? Let me see where we are with that. Yeah, what y'all think? Right there, a little brighter. I'm trying to keep y'all from going to sleep in here. Is it? <laughs> we go in there. Uh, yeah, last. Yeah, see, you, you didn't even realize how dark it was till we, till we said, let there be light, did we? Y'all like, no wonder I'm easing down there. Yeah, yeah, this ain't the movie theater. Now y'all, uh, sit up. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we going, it may not be here, but it can't be there. So uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Creel, for uh, helping us with our, uh, being our illumination engineer and, uh, and for our LC on the street. Two things I want to make you aware of and we'll receive our benediction. First of all, this two hour, I saw this, I want to make, I want to make sure that our parents know this and our grandparents know this. I don't know if you've heard it or not. But uh, Lunchables, y'all know Lunchables, the little, little snack lunch that we give our kids? Well, Lunchables have been found to contain relatively high levels of lead in them. I'm going to say that again. Lunchables that we give our little children, made by Kraft, they are under investigation for having uh, relatively high lead levels. The report says... The lead levels, now first of all, I didn't even know there was an acceptable range for lead in our food. And Lunchables is under investigation because they say it exceeds it by 70 to 74 percent. This is important because we're feeding it to our children. So if you had not heard this, then I just want to take this moment to let you know. So please tell somebody that knows somebody to tell somebody we do not want to feed our children with this kind of stuff. It is amazing what these companies will do to make a profit. And also, I want to take a moment, I want to take a moment to shout out uh, Coach Don Staley of South Carolina with her, with her championship run. Her team went 38-0, no, won the Women's College Basketball Championship. The reason, I am, uh, the reason I am singling her out and telling her congratulations specifically is because through this run, they have tried to attack her for being an unapologetic Christian. And everything they could possibly throw at her to catch her up and have her stop giving God praise did not work. She kept giving God praise. She kept giving God glory. 
And this is one thing that I want to say to this. There were people that kept saying, why does she keep bringing God into this? Why does she keep bringing God into this? Why does she keep bringing God into this? See, you got it all wrong. She understands God was never out of it, so he never had to be brought into it. That's why she gives him the praise she does, because for you, it has no, God had nothing to do with it, but she knows better. She knows God had everything to do with it. So I just wanted to encourage her and uh, keep the faith, stay strong, and there are many people out there that are praying for you and praying with you. Now, everybody stand to your feet. Time for us to go. My brother and sister, I thank God for each and every last one of you. And if by chance you are in this space and your soul is not saved or you are in this space and you have not given your life to Christ or you are looking and searching for a church home or maybe didn't even know you needed a church home. But here it is, God is speaking to you saying it's time for you to give your life to Christ. It's time for you to join God's church. We welcome you with all the warmth and love of Jesus Christ. You can go to lewischapel.org. At the top of the screen, there's a place that says join. You can click right there, give your life to Christ, and or join God's church. And we cannot wait to reach out to you and welcome you. And if you're in this space, you don't want to do it online, you just walk up to me. I'll be standing right down here in front of God's altar. You can let me know, Pastor, I want to give my life to Christ, or I want to join God's church, and we'll be so happy to bring you into what God has called you into, salvation and his Lord's church. Now, let us pray. It's time to go. Our men's ministry will be having a brief meeting immediately after uh, immediately after the benediction right here in, Brother Lowe, is it right here in the uh, sanctuary? It's going to be in the fellowship hall. Okay, it's going to be in the fellowship hall, brothers. Let us pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, thank you, God, for all that you are in our lives. And God, you are everything. For without you, God, not only do we have nothing, but without you, God, we will be nothing. So thank you for your love, even in spite of our weaknesses and our flaws and our setbacks and, and those things that we don't even want to tell anybody about. Thank you, God, for loving us in spite of all of it, for looking beyond our faults, God, and meeting us at the point of our needs. We pray that you strengthen us, God, that we, in our weak areas, we are made stronger through your power and through your love. God, strengthen us, strengthen our households and our, our families, God, our friends, and uh, even those that we will never meet. In those places where there is war and conflict, like in Palestine, like in Ukraine, like in, like in the Congo, like in so many places, God, that I don't even know to name or to enumerate, but God, you know them all. Not just in those spaces, God, but right here while on others thou art calling. Do not pass us by. And we won't wait until we see the breakthrough. We won't wait until we see the change. God will thank you in advance because we know that our God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly.